Hey guys, welcome to the secret history living inside of your aquarium. Today we are going to be talking about cribs in general a little bit, but we're going to talk about my new cribs, which are Pelvica chromis tineatus lecunge, and they are from Cameroon. They are from, and he's hiding in the cave right now. They're new, so let me let me kind of get her to come out so you can see her real quick, because I want you to see how purdy she is here she oh well, well, let's see if we can there we go so you can see she is a vivid vivid yellow color and just a beautiful fish i don't want to bug them too much they might come out while i'm talking just beautiful fish though so that's the lacunja crib uh found on the lacunja river um which was in french cameroon uh, at the time that it was named. The male, he's in in his cave there, the coconut that I set up. And the female, she seems to be hiding. So I've set up this tank. They've only been in here uh, 24 hours or less. And uh, basically, I am I need to give them more cover, but I'm kind of observing them quarantine style. And you can just see what a beautiful fish she is. She is gorgeous. She's got more yellow than most of the other crib species. These two were caught in the wild. So these are wild caught, and they are a pair that were caught in the wild. And I got them at the wet spot down in Portland, which is a great shop. And uh, let me tell you more about cribs. So... This is going to get into a little more history than probably your normal profile, but then we'll cover the basic needs of the cribs afterwards, and some of it will touch into that. So, first of all, cribs were named by uh, Bulger, um, who was a French uh, explorer. He also had German ties because when he started his exploration in Nigeria and Cameroon, uh, it was actually controlled by Germany. So here's a quick rundown. Cameroon has always been uh, a tribal country as well as uh, it has uh, sultanates and uh, tribal kingdoms. And as early as 1520, the Portuguese claimed it as far as colonialism goes. They took a lot of slaves from there. Around 1600, the Dutch took it over for slaves and then Germany takes it over in 1884 under, uh, under uh, you know, the uh, German Kaisers. They take it over, uh, wanting Germany to uh, project its power into the rest of Europe. And that's kind of what starts the race into Europe was that first move by Germany when they start uh, grabbing a hold of uh, land there, and then soon after that, you know, the British, the French, everyone is clamoring to have their own uh, protectorate or space there. So back then, in 1884, it was called Cameroon, and uh, in World War One, there was actually a famous battle at Lukunje River, uh, which is in between uh, B the Bupindi and the uh, Fifenda River. Um, and it's in between a big set of waterfalls known as Ibia Falls. And so it can't be traversed. The fish are different on the upper and lower sections of the river. And you get these different colors. I think these Lacunja are probably my second favorite crib. They are very beautiful. I think the Nigerian reds are beautiful also. But that also brings up something else that I'm going to throw in right now, which is in 2014, a new study came out by Lamboge, Bar Bartel, and uh, Del Ampio, and they came out with a thorough study of all of the crib species, and they have noted that biologically, um, the morphology of the cribs, all the Nigerian species, looks like the male's going to come out. You see, he's not quite as colorful yet. He's still settling in. They're hiding. She might go follow him. Uh, but she's really colored up and pretty. She's ready to spawn. He's not quite ready to yet. Uh, he's a little nervous. Oh, they're going to... Oh, and she's going to give you a shake. Wow, you look at, this is a great video. All right. So even if they hide for some of this, uh, you're actually getting a bit of a show here with seeing that shake. That's a traditional mating shake that she does to entice him. She'll, they'll go into the coconut then, and they'll uh, lay eggs. They want a sandy area to modify. And these wild-caught cribs definitely 
play with the sand and the substrate way more than uh, you know uh, raised cribs that are that are that are uh, raised in a aquarium. And now they're going to get out and interact a little bit. She, she's actually coloring up more as we speak. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but she's flashing more colors. And uh, I, I she once she's ready, she'll go into the cave. They'll she'll lay eggs. He'll fertilize them usually on the top or the side of a cave wall. And uh, yeah, so sorry I jumped there. But basically, what they found those guys studying in 2014 was that uh, the cribs in Nigeria and the cribs in Cameroon are actually different species, and they've been separated by at least a few hundred thousand years, if not a few million years. Probably when the coast was connected uh, farther out when water was lower during an ice age, they could have moved. Or it could have even been continental uh, lift and erosion and things like that. So it could be f way far back. We're waiting on genetics to find that out. So we don't know for sure when, but we know that they had diverged and that uh, the Tiniatus and uh, the uh, pelvica chromis versus uh, teniatus and the pelvica chromis pulchers are different and separated. And in the south, in Cameroon, you get uh, the pelvica chromis cribensis, or crib, uh, which is what they're kind of all named after when we say crib, but it's also the species that these are. And now, instead of teniatus, which the word tiniatus refers to in Greek, a ribbon worn in women's hair. And that refers to the banding we see on both the lip, the yellow banding, and the yellow band with the black lines on her side when she turns. Or maybe I can get a shot here. Yep, there we go. And they're very skittish because they're wild caught. So right now they're kind of in quarantine. They're alone in this tank, no other fish. And I'm hoping they'll reproduce because they're just just gorgeous fish, just beautiful. So uh, that that word origin then goes into the French, and it it is then pronounced uh, tenia or or uh, teniatus or ten e yatu, which then uh, gets worked into English, and ten yatu is now also a term for ribbon and. By now, I mean at the turn of the 19th century is when that came into effect. So now ribbon or stripe, whenever you see teniatus or teniatu, uh, it's that T-A-E-N-I that is uh, referring to a ribbon or a streak in all species. So that's just a little bit of a Latin background. It comes from Greek, then the French kind of took it over, and then we refer it back to Latin uh after they originally put named it in French. So the river is heavily, heavily um, covered by trees and jungle vegetation, lots of plants, so they need that. They also need moving water, not quick moving, but just moderate moving water, enough for some surface agitation. Um, and also the river that these ones, the Lacunja cribs come from, is the same river that was uh, used in World War I between the French and the Germans, and there was a vicious battle there where the French won and slaughtered a lot of Germans uh, in the streams, and it was reported that they ran red. Uh, also, this, is, this all happens to be 20 miles north of the town of uh, Kribi, or Kribi, which uh, is what Kribensis are named after, that region. It's not a huge city or anything, but uh, there's also some streams and things that stem from there, and that was a colonial uh, hotspot for things. So, in uh, 1916, the French take over Cameroon and rename it Cameroon, uh, and in 1919, at the end of the war, when they're deciding who gets what, no consideration to the local Africans, of course, uh, they decide that the French get to keep 80% and the English, because it is the London Declaration, after all, that they are signing, which splits up Africa after World War I again, the, the, the English get 20% of the country in the southern, uh, southeastern part, and the French get the remaining 80%. 
and that remains until 1958 when they have independence. So that's why you see these French and Latin names as well as the local names. A lot of local names have now replaced the French names uh, as time has gone on and they've reclaimed the history rather than being colonialist subjects. So the males tend to grow to three to four inches, the females to two to three. The tank, as I said, you want lots of hiding spots because they're pretty shy. When they're mating, they're very territorial and they're less shy, they will chase away other fish. But it's fine to have other fish in the tank like rasboras or guppies or anything that can, some tetras, some things that can hold their own. Killifish are fine too. Uh, anything that holds their own or does not stay in that bottom and middle strata of water is fine. So the killies that are up top, hatchet fish that are up top, African butterfly fish, and then anything down on the ground that is not a threat to their young, uh, they can chase away, but you have to be careful with catfish if you're using corridor or something like that. They could eat the eggs if the parents are not on uh, heavy parental duty. So just be warned on that. You always want sand or very fine gravel in their area for uh, spawning if you're trying to get them to reproduce. Also, it's good to have some tannins in the water. They come from uh, water with a temperature of about 72 to 84 degrees, depending on if it's the wet or dry season. And the ideal hardness changes quite a bit too, with it being as low as 30 parts per million and going all the way up to 200 in the dry season. At the end of the dry season, they definitely uh, pair up and they are territorially monogamous. And so once they pair, they imprint on one another and they will stay with each other for uh, extended periods of time, usually life. Uh, they live around five years, so that's a good amount of time in fish life and rather uh, adorable to watch them once they've bonded. They usually stick together. The male guards the eggs on the outside the female stays with them the eggs are around for about three days in egg form and then they hatch into little fry lings they stay in the cave or in the under a ledge or something along those lines the parents protect them and then after that the parental care and guardianship is incredible with these fish they herd them around like a little school of fish that is controlled by them the father is willing to lay down his life for them uh, and dart out in other directions as the mother is as well. So they are great fish to watch raise uh, their own little fry. It's really entertaining to see them with young. The parts per million in their water is also pretty uh, interchangeable, as I was saying. So that means that the pH is likely interchangeable, which it is. So they tend to have, if the water is running clear and, and a, lot, a good amount of water, it tends to be fairly acidic in that region. As low as 4.8 or 5.0 have been detected in, in the river that they live in. But also in the wet season, once you have a lot of tannins and things in the water and stuff has washed into the water, they can withstand up to 7.2, 7.5. I've got them in 7.0, and that's actually where they reproduce is 6.0 to 7.0, and with that higher parts per million uh, hardness. So that's just a nice little trick. Also, you can raise the temperature. You want it to be a little warmer for them to spawn generally uh, after it has been cold. So that is a little bit of background. Once they have the babies, you want to give them microworms, uh, something along that lines. Very, very small for them to eat. They're very tiny and they grow rather quickly and they can have anywhere from 20 to 100 eggs laid. But usually they, they tend to have, you know, something like 30 that survive. So uh, very cool fish. I hope you learned a little something, and I hope this interests you. If you know more and you want to let me know, if I got anything wrong, also let me know. It's it's a little hard to dig up this stuff. Uh, the Bolliger, who named them, uh, he named a good 70 to 80 species between 1901 and 1911 during colonial French-slash-German occupation of the region. He is also named birds and reptiles as well. And 
it's just kind of interesting how many paths cross in the story of these. Just in the naming alone of Cribs, Cribs and uh, Drakenfelsi, uh, do you think that might be German or Dutch? I don't know. Sounds a little bit like it. Definitely not French there. Whereas uh, Teniades or Pelvica Chromis are more Latin and French romance words in their naming. So I hope you learned a little something. I hope you guys take care of your fish. We'll check in with these guys later. I'm really excited to have them. I need to get them a proper home set up in here, but right now uh, I just need to make sure that they're healthy and I want to keep an eye on them. I'll dim the light a little bit later because that is what they are into. <laughs> That's what they like is a little bit lower light because they live under that underbrush in, in the rivers. So, all right, guys, take care of yourselves, take care of your fish or your cribs, and swim on. I'll talk to you later. We'll get one last shot of her. Say hello. So, all right, not super interactive right now. They're still in shock. I drove them up from Portland. I'll talk to you guys later in the next video. We'll probably be talking about the Maliwe cribs. They're very similar from a very uh, similar area, but there are some new stories to talk about in history. And I hate that I am leaving out the tribal history of the region, but it's simply not written down and recorded very well. So they have suffered an immense amount. That much is known that they've been enslaved and put on plantations and uh, exported and sent into slavery elsewhere and then also used on rubber plantations and uh, you know fruit plantations, things like that. But unfortunately, as much as I'd love to tell you about their old kingdoms and things, it's hard to find uh, this specific region, the, the history of that in English. So if you know something about that, I would love to hear it. That's just kind of an afterthought. All right, guys, we'll talk to you later. Swim on.